Interrupting the current neo-coronial cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed, this is Cricketude Busting Episode. With your help, folks. Cricketude Busting Episode, PTWRLM 414. As we estimated what the number of episodes would be that one time, as Vinny suggested, we need to I- identify where these broadcasts are. So there you are in the past cast, the post cast. However, you get this after the live, there'll be a broadcaster number, and that's what it'll be for this. So you can get the links and you can track down whatever interests to you. And uh, what interested me was finally uh, seeing Daryl Miller. Thank you for commenting in the RLM chat. I didn't realize you, I was hoping you were around. I hadn't seen you for a while. Anybody that's out there, I don't see too much uh, unless you comment somewhere. Appreciate that you're still around and listening and uh, sharing the information. And thank you for uh, telling us that you would. I appreciate all that. Again, I'm not really sure where I'm at with all this social media stuff. And I don't have a lot of time to put my mind to it. So I really ask, and really this is not just about my abilities to get the word out. If we're going to pull this off together, it's going to be together. And so whatever you guys, anybody you guys can do, gals, to get the word out. I really do appreciate it. It's really not for my broadcast. It's for the information. I believe I bring something that will help everybody. Not everything for everybody, but enough things around that you should see that there's a different way to approach what, what's up against us. And there is something up against us, if no one else has noticed. I mean, <laughs> how long has this been going now? And we're still not stopping it. And I just want to point out again, no Bar Association member has come up to step up and protect the Republic like they said they were going to help to assert people's rights and protect against it and take the oath to uphold it. You think when they see these, these violations that they would come right out? No, they keep dancing around the story, don't really do much about how to do it. They tell you they're doing some stuff, and then you go and you find out that, I, as I've told you, that they're doing the mitigation side. They're agreeing to this tyranny against us. We're, as a people, we as a people, don't have the basic tools. I mean, what happened to us is really astonishing. I mean, if I was told the folks, watch out, Mothra was going to attack us, I would, I certainly would have been laughed at. But just merely suggesting that COVIDzilla19, oh boy, howdy, did people go at crazy and sick with fear. And they'll, they'll hurt you about that. I mean, really, what a bunch of imbeciles. What a bunch of ultramaroons. The cartoon we become. And then all you, all you asymptomats are guilty for it. Blame for symptom deficit disorder. You're going to be the last one. It doesn't end there. I mean, this is no different. COVIDzilla comes out, everyone gets sick with fear. And remember, this is an anniversary of sorts. The hysteria about Fukuzilla. Uh, Fukuzilla and the radioactive plume that would envelop the Earth 10 years ago. Can we grow up yet? What has happened to people? And and I guess I don't know what else to say. Talking, uh, communicating with sound minds a bit and saying, I don't know what people interest people. You, You got information that helps you. You watch around, you see people getting beat up and beat down. And, and no one understands that's a lesson for us to learn. We're going to have to know a little bit better. And I've been hoping that I've been bringing that for well over 10 years now. I didn't go the path of most normal people. Doesn't mean my path was better, but I can st- tell you that as we, as I engage and have people engage, we, we work a little bit better. And in those things I tell you uh, to go look around for yourself, you hopefully are, are really doing the, the research to find out there is a better way. It doesn't. There's no guarantee, but that's the problem of our society now. And I found it interesting to this here we this week, geologic time within the same day, if you will, if you'll extend this to me for a bit, geologic time ten years ago this year, in the same month, we just I don't know if you noticed that 7.0 earthquake, that Japan, rocking, the area just 65 miles north. Uh, they did issue a quick tsunami warning, but that got kicked down. The point is that there's a, a fault zone over there. And geologic and ge- geologic science is what interests me, not the Fukuzilla plume that was going to envelop the Earth. But this is a 
is this a cycle now starting? Kind of interesting. It wasn't a 9.0, but it's still a 7.0. Not not nothing to sneeze at. I wouldn't really want to be living in a in a dilapidated building when that thing hit, and it did hit on land. So I wasn't when I first saw it a few days days ago. I wasn't too concerned, although we could get a little bit across the across the pond, our pond, uh, to the west coast. Not not much though. So and it did it was on land. It didn't it didn't shift anything in the ocean enough. So we're not going to worry about. It. The point is here we have a a dynamic Earth. It's it's rocking and rolling. And uh, I told you a long time ago when Banda Aceh hit, it destroyed a 30-year-old running long theory that I had that I could I could predict by subsequent earthquakes from init- initiating earthquake. I didn't quite get to the point where I could predict that earthquake. Uh, just the technology recently is coming on that we might be able to start to do that, and, and that's relative partly to the sun. And our interaction in this whole this whole thing is a big living organism, if you will. And anyway, so to me, it was pretty interesting. We were 10 years to the go to the day. Do we have a cycle starting? The Banda Aceh, the earthquake that changed the, the skin of the earth and put different tensions that eliminated my hypothesis to be able to develop and predict a secondary earthquake and in, in generally where in the world ended and then this been looking for a new patterning if you will if i can say it can be patterned now i'm wondering we're 10 years past and we get another pretty decent earthquake there bukazilla watch out folks covidzilla 10 years later it's all the same hysteria and there's really just underneath it is just being aware of what what's going on in the case of covidzilla it's a fabrication, and they figured us out. They figured us out in the monetary side. They figured out how to plunder the treasury everywhere. I, part of it is through what I call leverage funding. You can see it written right into the laws now. It's been going on for, for decades, and, it, and I'm, I'm shocked in a way that no one really pays attention to that, and no one sees how that works, and no one takes that, that to task. And I guess I'm gonna, I've been de- helping, trying to help some people, and since my suggestion of looking at what Alphonse Fagiolo was doing. I've had some interaction with some people, but I need to, I need to caution you here. I'm not completely underwriting what he's doing. And I just as I wasn't John Jay, but they do offer a better, a more obvious way of path to start developing a record, which I've been totally with. That's probably the, the part that I embrace, is that they're both developing a record. Notice, and be, you, anybody listening to me who's looking at that, you have to understand those are very distinct processes for very distinct things, like all this stuff is. Apply what they're telling you in the context of how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and, and in the big and where they're doing it. You can't come in after, as, I, as a couple of people have come in to ask me about, and I guess this is a bit of my irritation on some of this. You come after the accident to tell me to to tell me that. Ask me how, how you're supposed to avoid the accident, and then deny everything I suggest should have happened to to rebuild, the, you know, redo the bodywork on the car. It's kind of an anno- uh, annoying, actually annoying. I was going to say annoying. I'll say it. Annoying kind of a condition. You can't take these other people's work and just apply it to anything, anywhere, at any time. If you look at uh, Alphonse's work, he's coming from the very beginning of the first notice to address it. He even came a little bit late, was still able able to salvage it. That's important to see. Nothing is set in stone when you get to the paperwork stuff. You can undo things. And without invoking a bunch of stuff in people, you can use, there's remedies in the UCC. Not that the UCC is a remedy. It's just a body of code. It was officialized and nationalized in 1963. It tends to deal with things in services and contracts and certain things like that. And goods and all that. It'll lay out for you certain due processes. There's certain remedies within that that you can choose. I never cite to this stuff. I just use those remedies. Those remedies are essentially the common law, if you will, applied to a certain specific thing. And getting back to these people that offer suggestions that I've offered you to listen for them, now I'm seeing reflections of people trying to apply their work to their issue, and it's not applicable. And then I try to explain how to get back to where, in other words, when things are finalized through a due process or appear to be finalized, there is a process you have to do to undo that process. And all these other remedies come to bear. If you don't understand the subject matter that you're dealing with, my job is to get you to the correct path to get you to start to do that. When you think you know more 
despite the fact you've gotten your accident and you try to back, ask questions that are really just assertions of something you think you know about, you're not helping either one of us. And it's a waste of time for me. It's a lot, a lot of time and energy trying to bring someone along to get the idea. In other words, let me give one example. And I'll try and keep this real brief. I don't want to get too lost in this one. Coming to me to ask how you use Alphonse's, the Fagiolo's ability after you're through an IRS levy and lien and then levy and then don't know what a lien and levy is or the process that you went through because you used so-called patriot ideas on how you weren't, how you're supposed to ignore this thing. And then I explain to you what the condition is and you deny being a taxpayer though your condition started when you wanted to go after what that uh, stimulus check for the COVID. And I say, but you, you can't deny being a taxpayer because the only way you got your money was if you were a taxpayer. And you deny that? And you start a challenge. You say, I'm a challenge jurisdiction. You don't know the first thing about what you're into. And you're going to walk yourself into the problem I've watched so many other people walk, in, walk themselves into that caused me to look at a different way. It caused me to look at a different path for, for myself. And, and then I was told I need to communicate that to others. That you, I, I guess I need, I'm going to spend more time than I thought here. I almost wasn't going to touch this, but this is so important. You cannot take other people's work and just apply it for yourself. You have to look very particularly what they're doing for what they're doing it on. And, and for sure, you cannot take a presumed finished process, like, like a, uh, an IRS condition, which goes to, to, to levy no less, where they're actually extracting money. <laughs> it's like you cannot use these other people's ways to do at, get at it. And I don't have a way. I All I have is listening to the problem and saying, applying things, remedies, tools that I know are there to bring you back from the brink, if you will. Cause it to be the, once it's settled, so-called, you bring it and you cause it to be the question. The problem is, is you're not in the position of power. You're not in a position to question. Your, your, your whole job is to identify the failure, if you can, of due process. And there's ways to do it. And in that, inside that, is, this, is these ideas that you hear from people about capitalized names, miside misidentification, fraudulent identification, extortion, and all that. You can't get to those until you break the presumption and the due process that was provided that you yourself walked yourself into and ignored. Which irritates me for everyone that I hear. That's why I don't even get too much involved much anymore. In fact, I'm noticing I'm backing off. Uh, this is like the Bundy issue. This is that's a big deal because that was Lavoy Finicum got taken down because they just didn't listen. They knew better. See, this is our problem. We think we know better. And I guess this is I'm starting to feel this is what's driving this whole discussion today. But I'll just get back. I'll get on my tabs here in a second. Uh, you can't take what you're hearing anywhere. And just throw it in on what you think you need. You can't say, I'm going to challenge jurisdiction after you've, your deeds, your deeds, your act, your, your consent by act, by deed has done the pro, has created the problem and then deny it. That is what, and they'll be nice to you here. They'll just deem you to be a nut. They'll just deem you to be frivolous. They just ignore you. And that was the kind of the complaints. I'm being ignored. I'm being ignored. Yeah, well, they don't have to, your process is done. They don't have to listen to you. Y yes, we can extract the wrong that was done to you. We could do that. We can try. But you're not in the power position here. And you can't take the, these ideas that, like you even hear me say it, challenge jurisdiction. You can't do it after your deed. Remember, Lieber Code said it. You know them by when you seize them. You know them by what they do. That's a presumption in law. You're expected to be grown up and know what you're doing, that your de your acts are known and are are informed. You are under full disclosure. That's why it's so serious what this COVID stuff does. When you act to accept, they assume you know the full disclosure when you don't have a record that you didn't get it. I don't like how this works, but this is the way it works. Boy, am I sure way off. My mind is completely gone about this. But uh, this is so important. I guess it ir irritated me that much that it came out. I was trying to suppress it, and it won't. Please, for your own sakes, folks, don't listen to what I say and do do anything just without just because I say. Go do the the background. Learn that battlefield. 
And then please don't don't take other people's work that even if it's great work and just apply it to you because it may not apply. It's all everything is on a case by case basis. And and you want it that way because you, you want to have the property in your own actions. Otherwise, someone gets to come along and dictate it away from you. And that's essentially what the government has done. They've allowed you to dictate you. Again, there's a discussion I do not agree with. And I said this to someone. I said, I don't I don't agree with your assessment that you're not a taxpayer. They came back and argued with me through questions. And yet, I see the validity. You see the common sense of the question. But it's in denial of what the deeds were that got them there. And I'll tell you what, dealing with the IRS is not a fun deal. And you're not in a power position. So, so if you don't do this right up front, you can't expect to just do someone else's ideas. And getting to one of Alphonse's beliefs, I do not believe, is not my belief if it's a belief at all. That an agreement is not a contract. And when I heard that, I said, what are you talking about? Uh, miners. And remember, I remember I'm a, we do this mining stuff. Uh, that is the basis for many contracts is oral agreement to services or material or whatever. In fact, we've won a couple of cases that came to challenge by asserting an oral argument through with supporting facts because it was after the fact. But an oral argument took the day. It was just an agreement that became a contract that's enforceable. And so if, if you don't think that you're making agreements, or you, a service agreement's not a contract, you're, you're deluding yourself. What, and what's an application but a different form of service contract asking the motor vehicle department for so this is their service for to your motor vehicle business on the highways? You do that. What's the comp, What's the compensation? Your fee you pay them to for the service. If you don't think that sets up a contract, an enforceable contract, you're really deluding yourself. So I don't agree with that part of what he says at all, and I don't I don't treat that at all like he does. So you got to be very careful. And I guess I'm upset a bit here as I think about this because you're getting yourself in more trouble. You're becoming the the bad examples for people. But more importantly, you're hurting yourself and you're doing it under delusions that I've watched people do for thirty. Maybe it's going on 40 years now. i got to go back and look at some of this time. A lot of time has been spent with me looking at watch, watching this disaster that we ask upon us. So you can't take the COVID money and then deny you're not a taxpayer. You will not get that money unless you're a taxpayer. And I'm not going to get into the semantic between the hyphen in the middle of tax and payer. You're a subject. You're subject to that jurisdiction. It's on record. You've allowed the record. And it's over for that point. Now you have to go back and do the really hard work. You have two jobs. You have to throw that off and you have to do it with the only tools that are left to you. As I brought up the UCC, there's a couple of tools in there you can use. Whether or not they end up being accepted may be a different thing. And again, you're not in the power seat. This is why the power, police powers, you're dealing in the police powers and actually being harming the government itself in these statuses. And, you, and I see people denying that too. I'm not, you know, I'm harmed. I know you're not harmed. You just made a record that said you were doing the harming and they stopped you. You really have to understand what taxes is about. You really have to understand what your civil rights is about. Once you see this a little clearer and you don't go headstrong into this stuff, I'm hoping you'll at least take a step back, look around and say, well, this thing is wired just a little different than we've been told. And I can only tell you that's the way in the case because when I adjusted my thought, I started having insights I started adjusting the way I do. I don't run so quick to do certain things. I take a little bit longer time, although I can respond pretty quickly. I think I respond really quickly anymore, uh, at least initially to do a lay down, lay down some cover fire to, to, to slow the thing up. Then I get in digging deeper and we find out what the real, real path we can take out of the problem. Uh, I wouldn't have the ability to do that if I'd continued this idea Oh, I, I don't have any liabilities. My acts, uh, I don't have to take responsibility for anything I've done. That the record that has been made doesn't mean anything. Just because I say so. And I don't, in some regard, I think about that. I wouldn't want to live in that world either. Talk about it. Talk about an un unstable place. But this is what I hear. I see the re reflection of people doing. You're not understanding. There's other things going on. There's, there's a whole, and I, I have to agree with some of the things that have gone on as far as laying down the principles of application on how you go about doing this, how this thing is, because there's a check and balance for e either side. Everybody has their story and their case, 
and to the best of our ability, notwithstanding any corruptions, within the function of how things work, in the due process that's provided and allowed, and the things that are done in remedy for things that may be wrong, those tools seem to be sufficient that we're able to use today. But if you don't use those tools, and you don't use them in the right time and way, in other words, you're not getting in your car until you unlock the door with the key. And you can pound on the window all you want to say that, you know, you need to get in that car. You're not getting in that car until you get that key in or, or do damage trying to get into the property. And so there's a process, a natural process here. Not all of it do I agree with it, but I can do, do, do I agree with, but I can agree with a lot of it. And I've, again, I've embraced that part. Again, when I say go to the black and white, it's because that's what the refle- the officials are required to follow. And so it may be a longer, for those of you in finished processes that the record is against you, it's going to be a lot longer path. You have to undo it, and then you got to get to where the harms were. You can't just get to the harms because your record won't allow it, and no one will agree with it. You become a lunatic. You become the frivolous filer. You become someone who... Just argumentative, and they won't—they'll they, be nice at that level. They won't put up with it for a while until they—you really start causing damage. And I guess the other thing about this is I hear people making wanting to make claims against IRS agents after they've agree, the people have agreed to this check, tax check or anything to do with the IRS and haven't made the proper record that they weren't the person liable or there was no record of it. They agreed to the end process by not filing for it, by not defending against it. Or as they're not answering, they're not preparing their case to be able to answer when it, when the presumptions appear to work against them in the record, that they can come in and say, wait a minute, you just committed mail fraud here. And here's how. Remember, it's not that you did it, it's how you did it. The how. But also, hopefully, you've got the knowledgeable intent or in for official capacity, you've got the duty and obligation that's been failed, that failed in them, that they were to do that. And then based in what? Your constitution that they're employed to protect in some regard or administer in some regard. And so the analysis is not so clear that I, because I say I win, because I say that's the way it is. I'm going to watch, I'm going to watch with these, uh, and I'm, again, this is what, this is the loaded gun, the, handing a child a loaded gun problem for me. If I say go look at, listen to Alphonse Fagiolo's stuff or listen to John Jay and how you make a record for a mask in a store, which a woman in Texas should be doing right now, as she gets another problem, we'll get to that hopefully. When I say go do that, I'm not saying that everything that they're doing at all times is what you need to be doing. And I said I don't agree with some of what they do on some of the points or maybe even that you have to do it that way. And so listen very carefully, please, to what I'm saying I don't care. I don't have a problem with people asking questions, but when your your questions start coming to try and support your ill-advised ideas, unsupportable ideas on what I think I see would defeat those, and you're not taking wise counsel on that, you're just what you're you're setting yourself up for a hurt. Which again, and I guess to me it just it keeps. I didn't even think about the name until just now. This just talking to you. Lavoy Finnicum comes to mind when I say that because all those guys in the Bundy th- stuff didn't listen. I thought it was providence to be able to get to speak to those folks because I couldn't get a way in. And a way in happened. And yet they didn't hear. And a man dies. It's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And it happens all over the place. It's not just them. This happens to be looking for decades at people doing things they thought it was the way it's supposed to be, and they get slammed hard. And if I look back, and you know, it's the hindsight thing. Not 2020, the year, and when they were going to take us down. No, no the hind, actual hindsight, you look back and you see with clarity. Looking back on that as, ev- as the, the evidence of what's supposed to happen, if you just sit back and you look, you say, well, you know, they didn't know about a lot of stuff, and they just acted as right as it sounded, as righteous as they may have been. There was a lot of tools they ought to have brought to bear to not make a liability in jeopardy for themselves. Now, when I saw what those were, I incorporated them for myself. And that's what I've been asking, getting behind the woodshed is, you know, that dual idea. Yeah, I'll take, 
the, the little kid in you behind the woodshed. But more importantly, as grown-ups, we learn we didn't learn some lessons that we have to be now educating those that were our servants, if you will. And I don't get hot on this. Oh, you're my my servant. You, you I own. You know, I you work for me stuff. No, no, no. It, I don't get into all that. We have to go through a different route. It ends up being the same thing, which is a lot of confusion for people. But the other route we have to go through nonetheless, and not just because we say so. And we have to go through those routes because it makes that clear record. Why I keep telling you, when we start seeing the trouble that we're seeing in the country, even locally, you have to start getting a lot more engaged locally, if there, if not bigger records. Like I was pointing out how in Virginia with the so-called sanctuary counties, that really a dumb idea when their constitution gave them so much more power. And they had the majority of the community as the constitution required. And they didn't move through the constitutional power. You witnessed a bunch of people that don't understand the law, don't understand the law they made, even in the posterity. But if you do that better, you start learning better, you start getting what you need better. And we're in a position where we need more people. I can't do it. What I tell few people that do take it up can't do it. The colleagues, I, the called people I work with directly that are on the front line, uh, they can't do it. They can continue to only to offer suggestions. And a few of the people that will pick it up and run, we do pretty well. And I've explained a couple of those. They hit the national scene. <laughs> it's kind of interesting here. That I know people, you know people appreciate that point. Did it solve everything? No, but it's how can we solve? We're, we're being bombarded with problems. How do you think an act, one successful act in taking down a condition, how much, how many people are going to notice that? But in fact, it made a difference, and it's still making a difference. But you won't know that unless you get you're getting involved. Which, which was another thing about the miners meeting here. I get into the now. I'll move this into the into some of what I was going to get in the tabs. The as I told you, the miners are the microcosm of the America, the macrocosm of America. What miners seem to do, and it's the the salt of the earth, the mineral of the earth. These people, the producers of the earth, of wealth, the starting wealth of a nation. What they do reflects at the at the macro level of the United States of America. All the people. I can almost I can just take a temperature, and I got some terrible news this this uh, Friday. It, I about what's out there, what's not, what's not working. That means our country's not working. I don't mean work. I'm talking about protecting ourselves from the ongoing plunder and theft and impositions. And so, anyway, moving into, I want to go say something I didn't say last week. I wanted to mention relative to our talking and our speaking and things, an exclusive, at least unreleased a federal report concludes no evidence that free speech online causes hate crimes. Again, I, I just read the title. I'm not really interested. Some of the statements in the paragraphs, if you read between, if you, there's going to be a bit of this read between the lines just today, but you have to have a thought in your brain about how it really starts to work, not what you think how it works, but really start to see how this thing works. Understand we do have the problems, but you're not going to get at them directly, but there's clues everywhere about what the core of the of the point is on all this. Whether or not you're going to do something with that for you is, is not what I'm saying. It's, it's more pieces of information that where you can start to understand the puzzle that you're watching. And hopefully you're going to get to the point when that puzzle has a picture. And I've been told by, to, to me from people that have been working with me for a long time, they see that I have, I don't see the picture. I see that three dimensional, that three dimensional image that's inside the picture that we speak to that sits back there that works us. And so that's what I'm, we can see the picture, but do you see the picture within the picture? Like the little dragon holding the balloons, if I remember one of those, just a, a jumble of image colors on a piece of paper on a poster. And yet if you get your eyes just right, up pops the reality of what was planned in there. And that's what I've been hoping I get people to, to do. Here is looking through a lot on this story. It concludes no evidence of free speech and only causes hate crimes. Well, the fact that they're looking at something called hate crimes, there's so much to talk about here. Hate crimes is, is an invention. These are all lots of fictions, and lots of people get wrapped up in these fictions, and, oh, this is why I have rights, no, or this is why I have a, a cause. No, that's not true. Fictions can be, can be used. Fictions are created to solve problems because there's no other way to get at the problem. So they become a tool as well. It's when the tool becomes a weapon against a right is when 
we start to see the problem. And that's happening in spades anymore. But freedom of speech on the Internet did not lead to a rise in hate crimes, according to a report sent from the United States Department of Commerce to Congress in January, a report that has yet to appear on any government website. Okay, just the point is that hate crimes is created, that's under the crime law, but this came out of the Department of Commerce. Why? Think about that. Maybe put some time into why it would come out of the Department of Congress. And why? what does that have to do with your speech? And maybe you're looking at a jurisdictional authority. And maybe that's part of the uh, idea that I'm getting at about being able to understand the, the, the battlefield so you can move yourself just aside of what the train that's coming at you. But don't do it after the fact. You do it ahead of the time. And, and if you're going to not respond to these people, which you know, if any of you listen to me at all, and I hope you appreciate any time you listen, you know, the, five, the 12 minutes that Sound Minds tells me that he would get at YouTube over there, or, or five, or, what, or 10 minutes, half an hour, or thank you very much to anybody that can handle the two hours. I know I come pretty fast, but the whole condition has to be looked at in a way that you are not put yourself in jeopardy to fight it and you want to be able to set the record if you think that you're not going to respond to something that requires a response you better set up how you're going to respond in other words you let them commit and then you let them make all their errors and then you've been documenting that somehow in your non-response which is taken as in the in the presumptions that you agree in the, I don't know if people understand it. In the IRS, if you tell them you didn't file a 1040, they get to go back and say, well, you didn't file 1040s, and we're going to go ahead and file some other ones for you. They become your agent. Because people have a stupid stupid idea that taxes are voluntary. Oh, they say that. Well, yeah, they say it, but you don't understand. No one reads close enough. Anyway, I, don't, I get offline easy quick. So, Commerce about speech. Why is that even connected? But that is connected. And so, very important little thing here beyond the fact that there are no hate crimes for what you talk about. It doesn't elicit stuff. But who are you going to call? All you need to know here is that everything you hear that's evinced as hate, hate crime is likely one of those fictional attacks that you don't want to address directly. You address counter. You find a counter to that attack. This report would actually be helpful. That would allow you to say, "Well, you're just you're just asserting that fraudulently." There, here's a proof that doesn't. None of this happens. And so, what you're doing is you're depriving me without real cause. And at least you have a word to sidestep slightly the point, and it might give you the time in your mind to come up with some other points. However, as I say that, I wouldn't be discussing anybody, anything like this with anybody if that's if they were confronting me. I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time to be even discussing that. So it's another work, work out that you're not in the place where the train even travels. Then you don't have to worry about not being on the track. But here's the point. Inside the commerce, they're looking at this. As I, we're going to see, and I think now to get down the tabs, the government looks at things, whether it doesn't, whether it seems like it does anything with it. It looks at a lot of stuff. And when you're not making the complaint that will be round filed and do it properly, then you don't become the thing they look at, which if you, and I'm looking at this in a couple of different cases that you can use. You can use the fact they looked at it and either did nothing about it or uh, that, and not allow it to continue, which is a violation because, you know, 18 USC 3 and 4 sit right there. If they know of a crime, they, or they create, evasion to not have to look at the crime they're they're a they're a misprison of the crime and so if you understand the power we really have the power if we would just get together and understand that we can't be attacked and there is certain things that you can pull from in this case a report that says if and if you're on point about what you're saying that you are confronting somebody and they don't happen to like it they can't use that you're causing a hate crime and it, it devolves from hate crime to other things. Uh, you don't want to be calling people's names and all that. That could be defamation. So you want to, again, you, t- you speak the truth. We're not using these things to create av- avenues of, uh, of breach. We're looking, because that's our problem, we need to really have the take the higher ground about this and try to bring sanity to our world. And, and I have said, after looking at the mining law, the law brought peace. 
it says it right in it, the disposal of soil settles, settles the land. And it's not supposed to be under a continuing attack. And yet it is. And I've said, when you see that, you're not living in the place they told you. And it was up to you to maintain that. You had to keep that. That's each one of our obligations, regardless of how many excuses we want to make not to do it. Let me move on to what, what is it? Our, this property we talk about, why do we protect it? Uh, what, is it protectable? And notwithstanding a lot of things that I would be arguing, little glimpses that there's rights out there come about, and this is an older story I had to talk about, never got to it. I'm going to bring it up now, partly because we had a mining district meeting, Jefferson Mining District, and uh, we one of the things that I was bringing up there was the, the withdrawal of all the public lands, and that the land was given, adjudicated back in 1864, prior to the mining law, through something called the Sparrow Case, and it talked about the obligation of Congress to dispose of the lands. It wasn't supposed to be held by the federal government, but dispose of the public public domain, public land as the BLM would speak of it, which, because public land is disposable, where public domain may have a claim upon it, at least one. Uh, that the Sparrow case, by Congress's stated by Congress's forbearance of all the people in the world in the, in the United States jumping on the minerals, getting in the middle, all that boom we heard about in the history class about the gold rush, because and the Congress sent army after these miners everywhere. There were just the ongoing battles with miners, as there has been through history, and, and there as there has been in this country, United States of America, even after these mining laws, and uh, the coal wars is another thing. Uh, to, to talk about why why are we as a people we want to talk about peace no it doesn't the, the government's dis cause an unsettling of it because the people don't know how to settle that the congress by forbearing them people to extract minerals the sparrow case states that it adjudicates the minerals are disposed to those people as a class if you will as a group all of you all of you that are, they, they deemed it in 1866 to be a term citizen of the United States, which now has many definitions and it's brought, it's a taint. Uh, I'm not dealing with it in the taint. I'm dealing with it as a reflection of the people and the ability to gain a grant from the government that was obligated to dispose it to those that would best use the land. And the best use for mineral land is to miners. And that was the wisdom that was laid down. And so, and I'm going to show you how this is working through this next set, your, like your patent rights, because the mining law, the ultimate end and purpose was to dispose of the land, and that disposal was evidenced by a patent. And this is what evidences every land, every soil and land. Land is the everything on the land as well, where soil is that thing that's described within the four corners of the mon for the miner, the monument that he makes or she makes to carve out that part under the law to do so. And where Sparrow adjudicated the minerals to all the people in the United States, wherever minerals may be found, well, short of the prior grantings, which is, a, again, grant law being applied, there was no really, a pro, there was nothing the Congress could do. There's nothing, it's, it's what they call self-initiated claims. Now, you can't just go everywhere. But those, I'm just talking about the places you can go. And I'm saying that in the context of disposal now. Not that it's federal land. Okay, you can't go. No, there's a certain law. And if the law applies to that land and, uh, or that domain, that's where you go. That uh, There are certain things that are disposed already as a matter of law that aren't subject to agency and federal encroachment. And that's why what makes the mining law, I think every miner misses this. And I reminded our guys, our assemblymen, at the meeting here, what is so important about all this? The, this land was disposed to every American, and you just got to go find the places that are still open for claim. You have to go find it. But on Congress, there's obligations. They are not supposed to be taking land, and this is what I was talking about. They're taking more land. I told you they did when they came in, and they figured an end around. What we did at Jefferson Mining District was able to stop for over five years, and they figured out that if they go inside of Congress and make a law, it makes it look like they can withdraw the land. And we're a society that the little Jefferson Mining District can't, we have the answer to this. We have the antidote, but there's not enough insight and in people to really force it in. And the, that's the microcosm of the miner not stepping up for his own rights and his own ability.
which tells me what the rest of society is going to do. Because who, if you can't understand what what you have and in your possession, you have and hold in your possession. Why would I mean? What interest is it of you that you don't? Or what you don't have? So this is an interesting problem societally. We really should be looking at everybody, and this is where we get the weakest among us needs to be protected because if there's a, a chink in that armor, they can come and get you eventually. They come in through that weakness. Now here, uh, U.S. CART upholds miners' rights to explore on federal lands. So the problem was in this story relative to what I was talking about at the Jefferson Money District was they're withdrawing lands now. They're not. They're, they're violating Sparrow's adjudication for minerals to people. They claim that you can still enter, like the Wilderness Act, you can still enter the mineral land, but try to enter the land. And this is the administrative uh, administ- administrative imposition that's not lawful. But because we have a bunch of bar members that are ter- tearing down your country, they will not recognize the property any longer. Have no right to do so, but we have no mechanism to stop that at this point. You can't walk in with a property claim, even though the property, the mining law says you have a property interest. It's right of possession and enjoyment, exclusive possession and enjoyment or use. Okay, for the job of extracting minerals, the highest and best use of land where minerals are found is for the miner to go do. And it's been historic that that's the best guy or gal to give it to. There's something about us. We're just wired to do that the best. And so they, they hand they hand that servitude to us. And we accept it because what? They give us property that settles us, that keeps, the guy, the, keeps everybody off our back so we get to do what we want to do. But especially, so especially, specifically, the groups challenge the two mining-related rules issued by the BLM Land Management, part of the U.S. Department of Interior, the Bureau of Land Management, BLM. Not Black Lives Matter, which I think was done on purpose, but at any rate, convolute things. The pl- uh, plaintiffs allege that the rules were not promulgated in compliance with the various statutory authorities, including the General Mining Law of 1872 and the Federal Land Policy Management Act of 1976, FLIPMA the National Environmental Policy and Administrative Procedures Act according to court documents. A coalition of environmental groups challenged the DOI, Department of Interior, regulation asserting the mining regulations and properly interpreted the mining law. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I want to go back through. I've talked about all this, and this is where you have to understand the battlefield, what's all it's supposed to be. You have to look what this court case actually said. When the BLM is involved with the mining land, we have a, a potential question. The the really who's got the land it's public land it's still under a management of the blm if it's public domain in other words there's a claim by a miner on that land makes a total difference then uh, as to the the acquisition is now disposed to the miner notwithstanding the lack of patent there is nothing federal that can turn on those lands and nothing federal that can condition the grant and these environmental groups came in, and you have to understand what they're really, these people really try to figure out how to get at this. In this case, this judge saw it. But what's not stated in the story, and I want to show you how you have to really look and understand things about this. And I know most people don't deal with this, but it is about property. And there's a lineage, and there's in positions, and you have to understand that entire thing before you decide what you think you know. And I only analyze it through what I think I know. But it now, over these years, it's coming that I think I know really well, really well. And I can anticipate where it's going to fail, and I can anticipate what it's supposed to do, and the fact that I can anticipate what the law should have done and didn't is what their problem for the system is when they go wrong. That's how we were able to deal with the BLM as a minor, because the BLM is just a land management agency. They have nothing to do with the underlying disposal of land to a minor that is on our own terms, under the state law. And people get confused about that, but I won't get lost. So the environmentalists are saying they understand the mining law better than the BLM or the miners. But they attach a problem they didn't understand that they were attaching, which they brought in the Federal Land Management Policy Act, which I'm sure the fact was not shown that in the beginning at 1701 sub 3 and maybe uh, 9 or 11, the mining law is not part of FLIPMA. In fact, it's excluded. A specific use grant is not included in the continuing management of federal land. Specific uses are public domain, not public land. 
And if you don't, if you're like lost already, this is how they're taking you down. The subtlety between those two terms is like any other subject matter where you use a term and they use a term and you don't realize when you use the term or you did something that, invo- that brought on the status of that term within their authority, you pretty much lost starting out, just coming out of the gate. Your, lo- your race is gone. They attach flipma. No one would say this. I will tell you so you understand. It cannot do anything to the gender mining law. If you know where to look, you see the saving clauses. And I'm talking to you like this as far as the property, because those of you that can find a patent to your land, we're talking about the same exclusive possession that keeps the government from interfering. That you'll never really see an attorney ever argue. And we, Pacific Legal Foundation, in fact, I'll have some, maybe I get there, we'll have some links for some things they're doing really great. But we tried to get them to do our 2013 case. They would not take it. Why? Well, we were going to sue, we sued the Bar Association, right? So they're not going to bring shame upon the brotherhood. We all know this. So we didn't make a big issue. We just didn't go that way. We went our way. This is that you have to be convicted in what you know and, and not have a question. And when you have someone come and say, well, maybe your conviction might be a little bit off, do not disregard that. In this case, myself, and I just referred to some, a couple other people today, I know I'm not this. Well, I don't think so. You just did some acts that you have to be that on the record. Getting back to this, Federal Land Policy Management Act, then they bring up here the National Environmental Policy Act. I've talked about all this before as well. The National Environmental Policy Act has to do with major federal actions. And major federal actions has a definition, and it includes certain things. The essence of it is if federal funds are used for any federal project, demonstration or what an initiative or whatever, then there has to be a NEPA. Then the environmentalist brought up the Administrative Procedures Act relative to what this report says. The Administrative Procedures Act is something administrative in the federal government. And so the linchpin on this first paragraph, I don't have, again, I don't have to read so deep. I can see where it's going to go. And all I, then I'm looking for whether the judge did it right. And in this case, the judge did it right, but you'll never hear why. So here's some underlying power for us if we stay in the rights and we know where we are. The judge comes in and says that this environmental group could not prevail, that the BLM did not violate these things. And the question then is, why would they say that they win everywhere else? What, what's the power here? They brought up even the, they even used the federal, the general, the general mining law of, of 1872. How would they lose? It's so powerful. Well, you misapply it. Simply misapply it. What they misapplied actually was what? National Environmental Policy Act. Why? Because it has to do with major federal projects, plans or demonstrations, etc. And a mining law, mining entry, is not a ma- any federal act. It's self-initiated by the miner, the man or woman themselves. Completely within the exclusive power under the law to gain the, mo- the, 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 the claim against the whole world, even the government, as if patent and secured as if patent had issued. And I just said a little short sentence. If you don't understand the power of this against everyone, when you sit inside law, then you're, you're really missing what I've been saying, and I'm saying it again because I've talked about this before. This whole case turns on the fact that the environmentalists tried to invoke the Federal Land Policy Management Act as tied through requiring NEPA, uh, NEPA uh, National Environmental Policy Act, review which is not applicable to not non-federal things. And in this case, it proves what I've been saying about the NEPA is not applicable to non-federal things, and they can't be made into federal things, even by invoking the law that created the property to begin with. And so the, the BLM is shown to correctly administer the things relative to the mining law. And essentially, it's a somewhat hands off. There are some requirements, but but they're not they're not where they can interfere. They're not where you're dealing with the mining law of 1872, which is an amendment to a prior set of laws, which starts at the Sparrow part. Congress made laws for the orderly disposition of what Sparrow said was already granted to the people, cannot be interfered with is not a federal function, is not a federal action. 
It's simply the mining laws and these laws of disposal are Congress's fulfilled obligation to dispose that land to private holding for the best use of the land. And it ends up all being in production, which includes manufacture or industry. And so when you start seeing how this is laid out, you start seeing how the property rights really can be protected. You start to find out how, who the judges are that are violating these provisions. And you start to find out that we have a lot of work to do because they've infiltrated these people that will deny us our rights and that what Congress has already done. The law is our friend at this point, that they have encroached upon this. Again, in other words, go to the claims court where you, the law says you have a property in possession. As soon as you put your feet on the ground and have a valuable, valuable mineral, and the claims court of the United States will not uh, recognize a property, and the government's attorneys come in and will say that, no, you don't have a property because it was conditioned by a common mineral law, which is not applicable to uncommon minerals. Now we're back to terms, and you better know which one, which path you're on. That when they won't give you the property, then you realize the judiciary is completely borked. And when no one comes to help protect us against that, we're going to be suffering because that's the beginning of it. That's where the starting of your property is now destroyed. And so when I saw that, I realized we can't go to the claims court. I said, this whole thing is handled through what? They said it here. Federal Land Policy Management Act. Environmental National Environmental Policy Act and Administrator Procedures Act. That's what miners are ruled under right now. And how you protect yourself is you know those administrative rules, like I've been talking to people with the IRS and they think that they can say they're not a taxpayer. Go to, you have to go to those rules now. Those rules are the due process. The fact of it is you go to the beginning and you say, what's their jurisdiction? And then you got to work backwards. And so for me, helping miners and ourselves in my own mining claim, I looked at what's required underneath those three administrative provisions, and I would have been able to identify how they're not applicable. And how do we do that? We don't ignore the first notice. We don't say, oh, the letters in all capital letters name. We don't say, oh, we're not a SERP. Uh, uh, we, we can't say we're not a citizen of the United States because that's part of who gets the grant. Think about that and all the people that believe that the term citizen of the United States is always a bad thing. I've talked about all this before. Running through it again. Property. How do you identify, how do you identify, identify what track you on? Are you a regulable entity or are you, are you on your own right? Are you in your own self-initiated power? Can you defend it? Well, you look at the administrative world we live in, and there's rules there. The question is, can you show they're not applicable? Every miner, since I've been doing this, every uh, looking at it this way, which is since before the mining district, we've answered every notice from the BLM itself, and we've shown, because of the rule they bring it back by, that that rule is not applicable to us. Not our opinion. You then have to bring the law to show that's the fact. And all of a sudden, the record shows we're not within the jurisdiction of a regulable entity. We're not a federal project. We can't be blindly looked at as one by a judge. And when you start setting your record, the BLM in this case can't move against you because it's you've created now the question, the challenge to the jurisdiction that they have to finalize to ripen their administrative issue before they can get you to go to federal court. And everyone that we've been doing this, everybody who answers their notices correctly, even partially correctly, will never find themselves in a federal court. Everybody I've known who, who would ignore what I've said, d deny, I mean, just outright, just don't listen to what I've said after this was, they've all been standing in front of a federal judge and they've all lost. And so there's a way to approach this through the administrative side and it's not ignoring the record. Uh, we could go through the capital letter thing, but it's irrelevant to the point of a minor. When they put a capital letter trust name on a document, it's irrelevant. That's how they're going to deal with you. It doesn't matter if the whole jurisdiction doesn't matter, does it? So we don't even bring that up. We don't. I don't even have people involve themselves with all the intricacies that I hear people popping up with. It's like the Social Security number. It's in a sitting inside an IRS case, but until you can show they, they declare that that's subject, I wouldn't even care about that. The capital letter name, that does, in federal law, does mean something. That might come to bear, but you'd have to tie it to something that's inside. 
relative to a minor, it is it right. That, however, they designate you at the BLM through their notice is irrelevant. It doesn't even it doesn't even come to bear. Why? Because they have no authority up front, and you show that it's not a, a it really it's not that much of a of a trouble. And then you create this record that, that that shows that they can't. What I do, I just I just swarm the record, like uh, I did with the Forest Service, because our claim is sitting in Forest Service um, territory, if you will, who, who the land of which the reserve forest reserve, which is reserved for the mineral entry. And I went through with a 21 page. When they sent me the first notice, I came back with a 21 page. Here's how you don't have any authority in any area in any how. And we haven't heard from them too much anymore. They've done some certain things. I've told you about it. Tried to lock the road. We got that taken care of. All right? They were without jurisdiction. I can sue a federal officer in state court. What happened? The state court got involved, and the clerk's clerk obstructed justice. The Supreme Court underwrote that. If This is way back before 2013. If you don't understand, I know there's corruption. Yet, what was I after? Was I after the money I was suing? Was it my money, money I was going to sue? I sued the the district ranger's wife because she was partaking from his ill-gotten gains? No, I wasn't interested in any of that. That's just cover for me wanting to get the road open, which no one has the right to close. Well, unless they go through a due process, and that's under what? State law to whom? Exclusively to the county. And so the Forest Service can't close a road. The BLM can't close a road. The county can't even close a road. Unless there's an emergency or they've been through the process and given people uh, an option to discuss how they were going to replace what they what was forever disposed. Anyway, moving on. So this is a very important. Miners, uh, the BLM was shown to be within its rights because the, envir- the environmentalists could not show ultimately how the National Environmental Policy Act would be applicable through the Federal Land Policy Management Act. And so the miners' rights, if you will, are upheld. Now, it doesn't mean we've won. It means that there's other places that they violate us. And they violate everybody in their ignorance. As I've found out, I've shown miners left and right, but a lot of miners don't, don't really want to pay attention. They think they, again, they know so much. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. It's black and white. What's the problem? But this is what people do to themselves. Federal court sides with fishermen and their livelihoods in swords fishing dispute. From the Pacific Legal Foundation, the same group of lawyers that wouldn't take our case, default judgment. But they won't do it that way because we were attacking the Bar Association as well as the political parties and the function of the law within the state, which was violating the rights of the federal congressional disposal, which is what? Liability of the state to through the Ena- Enabling Act. So, you know, I just realize I'm talking so fast. This is so simple, folks, once you see it. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we win. It just means that we have a basis that's not doesn't put us in jeopardy. That I see so many people wanting to walk away from. A federal judge has vacated the National Marine Fisheries Service rule that threatened the livelihoods of fishermen on the West Coast. The rule implemented hard caps that would end the fishing season if any, if even two animals were, of certain species were inadvertently caught, despite existing mitigation measures that have been proven successful in protecting marine life. You hear a lot of things there. Those are all administrative impositions. The Marine Fisheries Service rules are terrible, uh, but you see, what did you see? The word livelihood. That's the only thing I keyed on. Why? Because livelihood is what you have a right to protect. You have a right to not be encroached upon. And if people started to learn, this is the same thing I advise miners. Your right to livelihood has been protected. Why don't you rely on that? This is not a business. They've confined everything into business, into commerce, which apparently the Commerce Department looks about your speech. Your your speech is strictly commerce in the face of the federal jurisdiction. And we've allowed that. We've allowed no separation. And so we get control. We, that's why Twitter has a problem. We have a problem with Twitter, all this other stuff. Here, livelihoods are supported where the court looked at these very same rules, administrative rules, and said, well, these rules are supposed to be reasonable, and you're not supposed to interfere cost the man and woman making their livelihood from fish. And there's a delicate balance that has to go. Well, what's, what are we speaking of there? It also is NEPA. They're putting a project, a conservation project on the fishing. What does NEPA say? If you go read it, it has to make, it has to look for the good of mankind in balance with nature, 
not as opposed to nature like the environmentalists say or activist judges do. All you have to do is read NEPA, and it'll tell you everything that's wrong with the court system and every trespass that comes on people that is so easily identified. I said it, Vince, easily. Not easily, but easily identified by reading the black and white. And so here it is again, livelihood, not business, but livelihood, your core being and right to survive like the right of Piscari is not an angler. It's the right to take fish for sustenance. Now, we could broach the idea that these fishers are the commerce and they do need to be regulated. But even so, underlying that is a right to make a livelihood. And there has to be this environmental balance that does not detriment mankind. I say that particularly because it says mankind. Some other discussions say humankind. And that's not really correct. But it says mankind, and that's a distinction you need to understand. Because what's in your constitution but men, and no derogatory nature to women because of the way it gets written, men, all you all, women and men, have rights that are to be secured to you. You'll never see that in these stories, but these are the things, the lineage and linkages to your rights that I hear nothing coming from people. And then with, with COVID, I thought it was so obvious, and boy, have I been disappointed and dis dismayed. The court casts its line in favor of the fisherman. Fisherman is the commerce statement, commerce identity. Uh, even so, Judge Trevor N. of McFadden wrote, finding the services rule violated the Magnus Magnuson Steve Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which requires conservation and management measures to minimize costs to fishermen. This is the NEPA stepping in the same language in NEPA and its purpose speaking again, consistent in the black and white. Now, why this stuff has to go to the courts, I really don't know, actually, but they do. And this is the problem. This is that tension that the lawyer wants to, the attorney and the judge wants to say is in the system. It's not, but that's what they want to believe because they want to make themselves relevant. When I have a self-initiating grant to enter the land under the law of the state to make a monumented place and claim the minerals disposed to that to, to entry in a federal land, now a domain once I make my claim pursuant to the local law, which is state law, no other man, woman, government, or agency or anything can interfere is in to interfere with that. That is a violation of the property, the grant, the authority of Congress, also national security, especially for a minor. If you don't think the, if you don't understand the power that we're, that, that's being ignored by these so-called environmentalists, by these Democrats and Republicans that would agree to withdraw land for mineral entry, they, I told you they just attacked your country. And I heard crickets. I heard crickets. Forget the listener out there, the general listener. I heard crickets in the miners, not from Jefferson Mining District, not the assemblyman there. We did what we could. But nowhere else did we hear, just like nowhere else have we heard from COVID, where everybody's involved. Same problem. Built to permanently ban mining in parts of southwest Oregon passes the House. Just before he left the office, former President Barack Obama ordered a temporary ban on mining near the headwaters of several rivers that flow through southwest Oregon and northern California. Now the House has approved a bill to make the ban permanent. They have taken more land now, as I told you they would when they came in and went through the back door to do this, in violation of the grants of Congress from the Sparrow case adjudication. They have come in and they're going to, they're going to take more land. They're going to take out, in fact, it's right in the area where we have our claim. That we're right at the outskirts of the Calmeopsis. We're right, uh, sitting right outside. They want to go into the next. They want to try, that's why they came after and attacked us. And I've shut that down so far for years now. Uh, they're not going to get that like they thought. It's going to cost them dearly if they try. And I'm going to have to put myself on the line to do that when they do, but I don't want to fight it. So I put my I put my barriers out before we even got there. No jeopardy to us at this point. And you can too. But yeah, specific to mining, maybe you not care, but this is your property. This is the codes against your land. This is the where you pay taxes. This is the, the, the fraud that uh, and the land taxes as well. It's all the same nonsense if you know what you're looking at. But they're coming to steal the land back. I told you this. Here's the other story I told you was on the going to come after they stole, what, a couple years ago they did it. Why did they have to do it that way? 
because we were sitting, Jefferson Mining Group was making comments to shut all that that withdrawal down, and it ran its course. We had a core of miners over on the coast. In, in the, the mining meeting, we have miners coming from all different places, so I get to hear the stories from around the state, what's going on. It's, it's a bleak picture, and that reflects the bleak picture in America because no one wants to step up. They, they think that they have to work in associations that are ineffectual. Instead of working man or woman to man or woman to do what they need to do and see what they have to do properly. Judge overturns Trump's swift lifting of mining ban in the West. So we have this complete dichotomy in the judicial system. On the one hand, they're recognizing constraints in the administrative side. On the other hand, you have judges overturning the mining ban, which Trump said, you can't ban the mining this way. You have to do other things. A judge, so-called, comes in and says, I'll bet he didn't have jurisdiction because I only know that this is uh, over land that was for entry that was granted. This judge in Idaho likely didn't have jurisdiction. How do I know that from this far away? Because when you go read your law and you find out, all those of you that will get excited over the 1871 Act, this is what we're talking about, codified the 28, I think it's 28 USC, what, 81 to 135 or something? Go read it. Fuck, go go read it, folks. Go find out where your Article Three courts are and what's in their place in every other state. This judge didn't have jurisdiction. He has administrative jurisdiction over a territory that doesn't exist. No one understands about that, but a federal judge on Thursday overturned a Trump administration action to allow that allowed mining and other development, other development, there's a whole lot more available to use on the public land that was to be disposed. That's another type of breach on 10 million acres in parts of the six western states that are considered important to this, for the survival of struggling bird species. United States District Judge Lynn Wynn Mill said the decision under Trump to cancel a prior effort to ban mining failed fully consider how a move would affect greater sage grouse, a wide-ranging chicken-sized bird that has been dramatically dramatic population drop in recent decades. Full stop. Let's go back to the discussion. I've told you before, my colleague, he's actually papered in in, 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 in academia a long time back. He's a uh, into he's he's got this covered. He was the one I went to. I said, "Okay, here's a bird. What's what's really killing it?" Now, he's got a mine over there right right near I- Idaho. I'm on the phone with him. We're talking. This is years and years ago. Well, he's got a biology background. He understands what's going on. He embarrasses the so-called biologists that come around to do their paper stuff all the time. And he explains to me what's going on. We set that up into comments. What was going on? Again, it's not that it's going on. How is it going on? We identified in BLM comments... They were going to use the sage, greater sage grouse to shut down mining in Oregon and Idaho. And we put comments in and we shut that whole thing down because we identified what the actual predator was. In fact, mankind helps nature by his, his desire to produce. And he's and more for the most part, people that are producers are not destroyers. Yeah, a miner, we got some images of the coal mine stripping the tops. Most miners are, are environmentalists, if you will. We're, we're, we... We raised bees, for goodness sake. I mean, come on. Histori- you look at the old paperwork. You see, miners were just, they worked with the nature. And so this image that we're destroyers, any producer is a destroyer is false. But this judge says that we have to look at a bird. There is a BLM record that this court did not research to find that what the predator is on the bird, which I will tell you is a raven. It goes and destroys the eggs. I think it's the raven. Happened to be an interesting problem when we told the state of Oregon because the, that bird, whatever bird that was, can't remember now. I just didn't. It flipped my mind. I don't remember what it was. That happened to be a, a, a sacred bird for Oregon. They had to make a special law so you can kill it because that was the actual mitigation problem to save the sage grouse. It wasn't that the sage grouse was dying because of miners. In fact, my colleague had the highest population of every bird at his claim. And that was the joke. We had the inside running joke. They, the BLM came to his mining claim because they wanted to see all the birds that lived in the area and in great numbers. Why? Because he understood habitat. And he could develop his mind to process, to make, to be able to work and also be a habitat. 
And so he had lots of animals. And so the, this judge overturning this is completely outlaw and completely without fact. Now, like I said, we can only be so many so many places at once. Had we had people in uh, Idaho that heard this case, we could have dumped something in that case and shut this all down or exposed, exposed the criminals inside the system, which is very hard to do when it comes to a judge. They don't have to regard the struggling species when it's not the man that's doing it, and the balance would be in favor of mankind's production. You don't shut the whole thing down. That's waste because the land is to be used. That's another principle violation. Anyway, talking like this, I just say, understand the underpinnings of the law, what's supposed to happen, and you can start to identify the, ex the extension, the wrongful extension from it. So embrace that black and white better than just throwing it off, and maybe we'll start to be able to have a, have a society of minds that start to work about how that this all should work, and really quickly. And it's not a big deal argument either. The environmentalists are really good at doing that. But they've been pushing this thing. The BLM knows all about this. They were given comments by, by, by Jefferson Mining District, and I wrote, I think I wrote all of them, with help of the colleague who was on, who was having to deal on the other end. You always have something to deal with. And in conversations, we wrote up the comments for the Jefferson Mining District that is now forever of record. If we had people that would step in, we would we could be able to press this thing through and actually get that back overturned. But no, as a society, we're not going to work to help each other, notwithstanding the attack that we're under. Now, so on one hand, we see the livelihood, granted rights, all this stuff is, is honored, although it's looked through the administrative hearing. On the other hand, you have a judge that will take down Trump's lifting of a mining ban that actually had substance behind it for something of insubstantial consequence. Something that is not the cause. There's no more look that has to be done. We actually, I think, as I say that, we can overturn that by bringing that comment in that the BLM capitulated to and say, here, this answer's already been done. It's not even mankind. It's not the turtle and the cow in the desert. It'll be found mankind aids nature when uh, people get their head out and start to understand how we've been taken down and how everything gets flipped. And that's how they take you down. Because you don't keep the ship straight. Up. You let the canoe get flipped over and you're always battling trying to get your head back in the kayak. You're trying to flip yourself over because they've got you. They're trying to drown you and you haven't figured out what's going on. So instead of f stopping what's flipping you over, no, no, you try to, you struggle. You struggle. And some of you die. So here, why are these judges so disparate in their decision? Comes up in a document sent to me, and as someone who made an, in, an independent complaint against the Tennessee uh, led, uh, Tennessee uh, Supreme Court, a little link uh, to uh, a report called "Chicago is the most corrupt American city." In a report, it wasn't interesting to me for the Chicago being more corrupt. We hear that all the time. We also know that's a democratic political city, but in my mind, it doesn't really matter. It just depends on how they're going to burn America, which party's going to burn it, which how fast. And Democrats are doing a pretty good job right now. The candle burning on the, burning on two ends. The Democrats are, are consuming America pretty quickly now. But corrupt being the most uh, corrupt, Chicago being the most corrupt American city wasn't interesting. But there was a list in a report that ends up being interesting to me, and then it occurred to me. Why we're over there in Tennessee trying to get justice and it doesn't appear. It's not there. Tennessee, which is not mentioned in any of the stories, is third on that list. I don't count Washington, D.C., which is the first, by far the first corrupt city. By how? By the reports. And this is the important part. By the reports of corruption. And I ask you to do a good report on corruption. You go to the canons and all that. You find the things that the ob the black and white that the official was uh, judge official was obligated to. You print. You find out objectively how they violated that. Print those as your complaint. Attach it to a rights violation. Attach it to something hopefully federal be on top of that that they shouldn't have done. And you yourself will be a number in one of these reports. And they use that as the most important start part of this report. Report to Congress and the activities and operations of the public integrity section for 2017 was what they related to. I wanted to see what this is about. They, in fact, if you don't complain, it doesn't make this report. If it makes the report over time, someone might report on it. 
it's a lot longer way around to stop to, to show something but if you're not making your complaints because it ra- gets round filed then you're missing another point that shows the government is paying attention they may not do anything but this report comes out that a university reports on and now you're going to be able to use it at least as facial evidence of the problem within the justice system again you have a lot more work where after the process has been determined themselves presumed to be valid just no different than you've got a lien against a pension in an irs case because you came in for fifteen hundred dollars and they looked at that oh thank you very much for your 1040 we're going to make 10 more years back and we're going to charge you thirty thousand i think that whole thing's a scam they charge, as I said, pointed out, they got, got gave you fourteen hundred to give you to get from you thirty thousand, and now you now the pension is being taken. That was a pretty slick scam, and yet if this scam goes on because th- there's also this lack of protection, things secured to us, we're walking around ignorant of our of the condition that we're against, and it's because of judiciaries that won't work out directly and quickly what's supposed to be happening. A report to Congress doesn't sound like much. I wouldn't have much to do. When I read through the list of what they do, I looked at the the, the country, the the state that uh, would be the government that I work through. Complete corruption. It's at the bottom of the list. Why? And I have to be guilty of this. I never followed through with an integrity a, a, a complaint that would have touched the public integrity section because I didn't and likely anybody I knew didn't because we just said give up it's going to be round filed anyway we didn't do like the next step at the time this is years ago like what Alphonse Fagiolo is saying go ahead and take it to the next step make your complaints get the insurance company to start looking at it no we did the insurance style claim but we didn't press it for the complaint this kind of proves out what he's saying on the report that the government will make a report that you can then use as government statement of corruption. If you're not making your complaints, it can't make it to the report. So it's going to be round filed, but someone's counting. They're accounting for all this. So that was for me the best important thing. Second to it was that we, that if we're not making our complaints. Even if they're going to be round filed, they don't make it to reports that we can't use later to say, see, this is the problem. And your states are not not a, adjusted quite correctly on their actual corruption. But that they were in this one state that we're trying to get justice and we can't find it. I now know why. And interestingly, the, there's a dual path attack going on. And we've just confirmed that they're, they're, the states will embrace fraud. And this speaks directly to the COVID, why the COVID continues and why the Bar Association, uh, no attorney steps up to fight it correctly. It is what I've been telling you behind the woodshed. They embrace fraud. So if they embrace fraud, like I told you after 2008, there is no fraud that will not see, uh, that will not now work in our world. It it is now reflected clearly in the judiciary. In a state, I can now see there's report. People in in Tennessee have been making reports. So it rose up on on the list. And I can see that the state that I was dealing with that denied me justice and denies everyone else I know justice by the black and white, not our opinion that we're right. No, it says right here, this is the way it's supposed to work, and then you can't get that. I have a right to access the court, but the clerk can stop me. It's not justice. No other reason. When the Supreme Court embraced that, I found that out in 2013 or so, I don't know, 20 before 2013. Uh, okay, so now I can't get I can't get justice embracing fraud okay that's it that's that's the reality of the battlefield now what do we do as a people well as a people we've been doing nothing it just supports the view i have in an objective way and i can only tell you and hope that it fires you up a little bit on maybe rethinking how we get at this thing so this report to congress was kind of interesting it's a maybe three or four step removed it comes out every year apparently now i know it exists if i really if i had a crew of people we could start working this up pretty nice now I realize that we have a report we can start making. We can actually, maybe Alphonse Fagiolo, once you do, you start from the beginning with the notices and you start doing your documents, maybe going and pressing harder on the claims for insurance and or uh, judicial complaints or bar member complaints, maybe those, maybe there's a valid, actual valid, tangible thing for that. 
on other hands, no, I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't agree with what he, he believes. I don't agree that a service contract's not a service agreement's not a contract. Every agreement's a contract. Stop. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So let's look at that. Maybe we've been falling another place we've fallen down. It's like I'm telling you to write comments. We can make a record. It's a public record now forever, if you will, in the public record that says that Jefferson Mining District had the insight, showed where the real problem is. It's not the sage grouse that being killed by mining. It's the sage grouse being killed by Mother Nature. And maybe we should be focusing our attention elsewhere. And maybe we should start stop letting these judges and these environmentalists shoot us in the foot, if nothing else, in the kneecap to hobble us around while they destroy us in other ways. So, interesting little report here. I think it shows some more avenues. I know most people won't even consider it. But there it is. It's on record now for you. I wanted to show you there is, we could be doing much better. I've known, this is what I say about the Jefferson Mining District, had the miners held together, we could be, we would have had an army of miners on focus, on point, utilizing all these kinds of things. A little, so we had working groups, little working group on each different type of problem we come across. With a couple hundred people working like that, an umbrella overarching purpose with individual mobile fluid acting groups over particular focusing on particular things I thought would be a very good thing but microcosm being the miners that it is of America when the work started to have to happen everybody seemed to want to run away no they'd rather have one or two of us write all the paperwork and they didn't even want to even make the first phone call at any rate Congressional Review Act will reign in regulatory state. Another story from Pacific Legal Foundation. Again, the regulatory state is that administrative imposition. I say you, you might as well just embrace that. When I did, we can now go through the Administrative Procedures Act, which is, I'll tell you, is a lot clearer on your rights as far as procedures anyway, uh, on how to address this. And we can kill it before it gets into the judicial side. You make a record that doesn't allow it. And when you get, if they do try to move, which they never have yet, then you get you have the you have your record to show they didn't have the right already in their record. This is an interesting insight for any of you that are listening that may consider it. I'm not quite sure how to really use it yet. I saw I've just run across it when I ran across the Pacific Legal Foundation on the other stories. This one popped up, so I brought it up for your attention. There is a way possibly to get into Congress. There is a way to get in that the Congress will have to review what a regulatory agency did. This is a regulatory thing that really is needed when you hear of people going and lobbying. This is the type of direct lobbying that would work for producers. And this is, again, if we had people not like what I've reported on MMAC being a criminal organization, trying to invoke administrative site imposition for more regulations and more bloated bureaucracy. No, a group like that could go in and, and lobby Congress and say, no, this is a bad rule. And here's why. This, and you just, Chapter and verse, the law back out, could be something and a tool. Pointing this out, as I was asking at the mining meeting and got just immediate response, I said, what if we can get individual miners just to start writing letters because I'm thinking about this type of stuff? Because we're not getting much response at all. And I was told that there is no mining association that's even meeting right now, COVID, at any rate. That doesn't stop us. We're looking. We just needed a place. We finally got it. We're we're meeting. We're meeting because we found a place. The, the, we're not stopping because of COVID. I said, well, okay. So the there's no mining association stepping up to protect the miner. What about the miner themselves? What about each one of the miners that isn't going to a meeting? Can we get them to write a letter like to go against this, to show that these rules are killing us? And I'm talking as us as a nation as a people. People, the miner on the ground making the mineral, the farmer making your food, the rancher making your beef, all under attack. Can we get some people together to write a statement that says, underneath this act now, black and white, power, this is not a good idea. And you you got to do something. Stop it. Just an option. Another thing, I just look for potentials. For as, as dismayed and as, and as I want to throw my hands up all the time and just walk away, I just see the potential opportunity. It just takes that one. I'm not the Tony Robbins. Maybe one of you is. Then the light, we light the fire. The strike the match, light the fire. I don't know what it's going to be. It's not me, apparently, and probably not. It's somebody out there that's going to do it. I, I don't think it's going to be the Ammons, and I don't think the Bundys, and none of those guys. It's not going to be any of that. It's going to come out from left field, I'm sure. 
Victory. Court sets aside CDC's ban on evictions. Then we move into, again, Pacific Legal Foundation. The, the, or the lawyers group, the attorney group that wouldn't take our case because we wanted to do the law. They can only do administrative stuff. If you hear, everything's coming through administrative. Everything comes through the administrative side. And it's a defect on the administrative side. Your property rights is not administrative. In fact, you do not have to exhaust the remedy when your right, uh, administrative remedies, when your property rights or your rights or fundamental rights are being violated. There is no exhaustion requirement. Uh, boy, I pause. I just want, if you knew what that meant, if you folks really knew, I don't think you'd be crickets. I really don't think. But you don't have a faith. You don't have a belief in your own self, in your own system. And I don't have a faith in the system, but necessarily that when you start asserting and you do it in mass, like a tidal wave, like the Fukuzilla uh, <laughs> that came, supposedly come and plume, uh, invade your land and re radioactively kill all your land. You didn't care that the hospitals were producing the radioaction or your labs and all this other stuff. Like I told you, you didn't care about all that then. Maybe maybe this COVID. No, no, you won't. COVIDzilla19. No, no, not going to do it either. But I don't know what's going to take. But it's there to do. And it's right here. I looked at all this news. It's just, again, more notice. Court set aside CDC ban for evictions. It says here the federal judge ruled today that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention overstepped its authority in issuing a nationwide eviction ban. In other words, Congress never gave that power to the CDC, ever. Now, I want you to look at that and say, wow, that must mean if the legislature never gave a state authority that authority, then they don't have it. And what they did dictate to the leg to the executive must be followed. You start reading this paper and you see that. Maybe you'll be more closer to what I've been trying to get you to see. Th this is an administrative rule that overreached what it was told it could do by the legislature. That is exactly equal to putting that imposition on your executive branch in your state regarding the COVID here. What did the state legislature give to the communicable disease provision of law? Is a process to identify singular vectors for the epidemic. What did they give to, which seems to be, oh, no attorney knows how to argue, how to find out how there was a limit on the power of the governor in an emergency. What limits that? The, the need to demonstrate the exigency for that police power invocation. Why can't any attorney to show that that hasn't been met? The legislature, the Constitution didn't delegate that power sufficient to do what they did is in this case relative to lifting the CDC having the audacity to say that your property rights, your local law is condemned by the CDC over its purpose. Fascinating what went on, what goes on. And a court case, no less, had to tell you that. Now, what's this all end up being, being about, about the commerce thing? I talked about your free speech is actually commerce speech. In fact, if you don't condense, condense the thing down into a commerce-related thing, likely you're not going to have a right. Not absolute. Is this. Here's what's going on. Here's why it's been so important, ultimately, that the scam gets shut down and I've offered since way, since back in March when I finally felt confident enough myself to say there is no test, which was not the end-all be-all. It was the beginning. If you take out the knees of them being able to prove the demonstrable exigence, they have no police power they can get, correct? I'm not talking about there is no test. I'm not talking about PCR. I'm talking about undermining their ability to acquire police power. So I'm talking not directly to what I'm talking about because it's all tied together. It's all connected, right, Grimner and Circle? It's all connected, but on its own terms. And so I'm talking about taking out, there is no test. Take out the PCR because they, that's the only thing that they're using to what? To create the fraud. If I take that out, I've exposed the fraud. And they can't, well, they've been able to, but they're not supposed to be able to run police power on a fraud. Except that we now have proof that a Supreme Court does embrace fraud. It embraces fraud of its members, the commission of fraud in its members, and of the executive branch. That's not an independent uh, judiciary either. There's so much that fails. I said, you're not living under law now. You're living under tyranny, and you're quiet to it. Pfizer sees a significant opportunity after pandemic to hike prices 900% for annual COVID-19 shots. If that doesn't tell you everything I've said, 
what this thing was going to. This is about money. This is about the commerce. This is about promotion. This is about a false pandemic. And as soon as this, the license, the the issue is law is um, relieved. It's no longer under emergency. They plan to rise prices a nine hundred percent to you, and it's going to be in booster shots. This never ends. Just as I've been telling you. This is lots of people have been telling you. And the other thing about this is interesting. Well, I'll read the first part. Recently, comments from a senior figure, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical giant Pfizer. See, pharmaceutical and Pfizer. The P's are silent, I'm telling you. Have highlighted how the company is looking to turn COVID-19 into a longer-lasting pillar of its business model, including dramatically increasing prices that would come become, would become annual booster shots, as well as the possible effects of a third dose, and I'll add, and the side effects, whatever those may be. Let's go to the point. They are attempting to give, they just made an avenue to make more, they're brokering harma, just like the who, as I said back on the pig's fly flu, this is now coming out, it's not going to end. And it, they already agree that their current, their current uh, doses of the jab this cancer treatment, AIDS giver, AIDS symptom giver, is not keeping up with the mutations, which are what a flu does. It's natural, except for the synthetic part they're injecting you with, which is proprietary. I'm now seeing stories. I don't know where they get this finally. It took a while, but they're fine. people are also coming around to what I said before, the proprietary change of your DNA where Monsatan proved that they can infect your property, a, a, a neighbor's property, and win against that property owner. That trespass was a win to the trespasser. I said the future is bleak when they start getting this gene therapy, proprietary gene therapy, novel gene therapy working. And we're in that day right now. Boosters. They're going to make sure they keep that thing going. We don't know what the side effects are. This is the whole game plan. The bottom line, commerce. That's what the federal government protects and promotes. Your speech is considered a commodity, an accountable commodity, which has now been shown to not be hate speech, even when you claim it to be by Twitter or Facebook and whatever. And speaking of Twitter, I'm again, I don't have quite the time. It's not that big of importance. I'm barely posting there, just enough to let people know. But for those of you that notified me on things, I lost from back in February 27th, Twitter has taken out every notification, and then this week, I've gotten a few back uh, that were from people responding to last week. They completely took out my notifications. Uh, they've added more ads. I'm not. I mean, I just. I'm not even dealing with. It. I just throw the join me, and I'll throw in the link. But uh, Twitter is is pretty much going to be gone. And like I said, I don't do this. I don't do this um, uh, social media. I really maybe should be, but there's just so much uh, that I'm dealing with right now that I just can't get my mind clear to think about where else I want to go. We're on Minds. I'm on BitChute. I had a couple of you are posting on BitChute that are mirroring the shot site, and other, and other people are giving that uh, space on their websites, on their uh, posting their video sites for this audio broadcast. I appreciate all that. That's how we're going to do this. It's likely not going to be through through Twitter anymore. It's But anyway, just so if those of you that have been notifying me and I don't see it, I may not see it. I, I don't even know. I just realized that I signed in, and that's the last thing that they, back in February, that's the last thing that they've posted up until two days ago, and then a few of you got put in. So, anyway, moving on to this. Exclusive regular booster vaccines are the future in battle with COVID-19 virus. Top genome expert says. Regular booster vaccines against the novel coronavirus, that's the synthetic, proprietary, made-up virus will be needed be needed because of mutations that make it more transmissible and better able to evade human immunity. Is it? And is it if they cripple your immunity? They don't even talk about building your immunity. This is novel. This is new technology that transcribes into your system their proprietary information. Again, all this stuff is written. You have to know how to read between the lines. Some of these links I don't even want to put up because I think it's like the kid with a the little little the child with a gun. I put the link out. You think that's what I'm saying? No, this is if you, the surface of this is the lie. It's the fraud. 
if you read between the lines, you see what's going on. If you can see the the pic, the poster and look 3D into it is what I'm asking you to do for yourself. Then you get a better perspective. When you see that 3D view, then you can choose where in that domain you want to enter if you want to enter. If you decide not to enter, stop complaining. Stop. If you see something that causes you to focus in and then you look in and say, well, that one's a battle I don't want to wage, then you can't also just complain. You just have to stop doing and go focus your attention somewhere else. Just don't become a complainer that way. You actually fortify it. You actually send a negative energy out that fortifies it. So booster shots are on the way. 900% increase. It'll be like $150 a shot. And then we're going to be into the potential of ma mandatory type stuff. And as long as you remain crickets against this, they think they can get away with it. And as long as you are crickets, I know you won't be practiced enough to be able to stop it when it knocks on your door. Pfizer, deal with Operation Warp Speed, excludes common government rights. I found this fascinating. This speaks all the way back to that patent from the CDC that was de de rejected by the patent office ultimately that they keep holding on to as hold as a club over these companies. The 1.9 billion B, bravo, billion contract, dollar contract does not contain government rights to intellectual property developed in the manufacture of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. Do you know how to read between the lines there, folks? This is made up for you, this whole thing. And then we get a little bit of concurrence. And I'm, I should say this first because I'm hoping I get there when I remember to say it. Sound Minds did some deep dive on some of the things I've been saying. And it ties in with what he found. It was a major data dump. You're going to have to get the link uh, on the on the blogcaster to his true live uh, website, which is an uh, all YouTube alternative. He's got a gob of links that if you read, you can't read. The surface stuff is the fraud. You can believe it, but it's the fraud. The reading between the lines, which I couldn't even talk about here. There's so much. Concurs everything, pretty much everything I've said. A couple little outliers, but not really too much at all concurs with this and he brings up the fact again in his research this starts from that cdc patent if i saw the paper the page correctly and then he's got a, how this integrates with the military with the companies with the commerce department with the c all these players and actors and fraudsters this was made for you this was made to make this thing go and cripple you for the rest of your life and cripple your prodigy progeny for the rest of their life and we hear the proof again of this <laughs> right out of the, the mouth of the problem itself. China, and I won't. I was going to play some of these videos, but my audio is now in, not set quite right. I think the audio is adequate for my voice, but it will be too much uh, for the, uh, the vid, to the vids. So I don't want to play those quite yet until I can understand it. And to remove it, I might disconnect myself. I don't want to try that yet. But it, here, China's top CDC, China's CDC epidemiologist confirms China has never isolated the COVID-19 virus. He says, and I wish I could play it, although he's got a somewhat of a thick accent for the shortness of what he says. It may have been difficult anyway to hear. He says that's the issue. They never isolated. Now, those of you that have been around, you've heard me say that for, forever. This was a story. This was adopted by the United States and promoted. Well, I'm not going to. The direction it came from is irrelevant. That your state communicable disease law was not implemented, allow it to continue is your problem, and that's what I focused on. Everybody, hopefully, I'm thinking everybody would step up, step up and do it. Only a couple of you started. Uh, one one guy is doing something, and he's reaching. We're now exposing the same fraud we expo I exposed in 2013. We have to do it a different way. Will anybody notice? I don't know. Will anybody care? I really don't know. I don't doesn't doesn't sound like it. But but anyway, I, we're hope beyond hope. We act despite ourselves, uh, despite the the crickets, the, the people I work with. Uh, China's CDC and, and epidemiologist confirms that China never isolated. He says the issue is that's the issue. It's never been isolated. Then what is this thing that they're putting in you? Has to be the novel synthetic proprietary thing they've invented. Fascinating as that technology is to do that, still, still, and I don't want to. I want to open something else up that's going on, and I don't know if, why I dislike this guy. He isn't his father, and he proved it again to me. And I'm going to bring this up. I wish I could like him, but yeah, I can't. There's just something about him that's just not wired right. 
that a part part of it's a little bit Ron Paul. Uh, I wasn't. He had some. He's a cool guy. He says a lot of cool stuff. For the most part, I, I really. Oh, these guys, we could be friends, right? We all could be friends. But there's just a way they approach things that allows other things silently to go behind the scenes that that go on. Rand Paul, his son, is not even that level. He comes out with something that is promoted on the internet from Fox News. Rand Paul on explosive clash with with Fauci. That he Fauci keeps moving the goalposts. There's a video I came across looking at some other the China the China story, where they haven't isolated. The problem is that China never isolated this. They don't think it came from the wet market, and they didn't isolate it. Then Rand Paul comes up, and he's on the news discussing an interview in a, in a news thing uh, against a discussion he had in Congress, or is he a senator? I don't even know what he is, against Fauci. And Rand Paul keeps saying, this is theater what you're doing. And Fauci says, here, go, here we go again with your theater. And there's a contention that Rand Paul is building based against what Fauci is suggesting with masks and all this other stuff. I want you to see this, and I want you to see what Rand Paul says after in the interview of the news. And I want you to hear for yourself how Rand Paul agrees without reservation that everybody needs to get a vaccine. And I want you to then think about whether who's doing the theater. What's the theater? Is it this little show that's going on between Rand Paul and Fauci that Rand Paul comes out and says Fauci's wrong and yes, everyone should get a vaccine? Is that really the theater? Is it the one Rand Paul thinks Fauci's pulling or the one that they're both pulling? Because there's no way any doctor can actually say a good doctor, which is, is Rand Paul should be, says, I guess, can claim that everybody should get a vaccine or that it would be good. Or if you know what the things I know behind the woodshed or have researched yourself independently like Sound Minds would have done, did, to go find out the find out in a different path the same information, that this is not something that you would toy with, not the way they're doing it. It's not safe. It's not a vaccine. He doesn't even, he has no equivocation to say you all need to get the vaccine. And that's a problem for me. I don't know about you, but this guy, Rand Paul, he's dangerous. I think you're witnessing the theater, both of them. They each have their own problems. They're both trying to sell you on something. guy that's not trying to sell you too much, I think, and I say that because he's consistent. I find myself consistent with what he has been saying and a lot longer on these matters than I have being he's a doctor. Dr. Coleman says this is the most crucial video he's ever made about COVID-19, and he has to have it shared. And he explains the rundown about how all this is not working, how there's nothing that works out well with it, how it can't work out well. I've given you a link to that vid over at Brand New Tube and then his website, and then to a document I had to track down. It's a an uh, Twitter uh, image, so it took a little bit to find it. From a Geert van den, ba van den Bosch, DMV, PhD, independent virologist, a vaccine expert formerly employed at Gavi and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Coleman references this guy, one of the guys that promotes this, who comes out in a letter and says, what you're doing is not, may not be really advisable at all. Dr. Coleman goes on to say a whole lot more things that you really need to maybe listen, maybe take notes. Even if self-preservation, if nothing more than just self-preservation, understand the, uh, the underpinnings of what's going on, whether you, you use it or not. Here is an authority that is in on it, in the situation, in the groups that are imposing this, who starts out to, to say to all authorities, scientists, and experts around the world, to whom this concerns the entire world population. I'm going to jump to the second paragraph. It implies what he said in the beginning. As I stated, I am not against vaccination. On the contrary, I can assure you that each of the current vaccines have been developed, have been designed and developed and manufactured by brilliant and competent scientists. However, 
this type of prophylactic vaccines are completely inappropriate and even highly dangerous when used in mass vaccination campaigns during a viral pandemic. Vaccinologists, scientists, and clinicians are blinded by the positive short-term effect in individual patients but don't seem to bother about the disastrous consequences for global health. Unless I am scientifically proven wrong, it is difficult for, to understand how current human interventions will prevent circulating variants from turning into a wild monster. He writes more. Just want to let you know there's somebody who's been inside of this who doesn't like what he's starting to see. Maybe he's gotten a conscience. I don't want to dissect all the words here. You've, there's lots, I was hesitating left and right. I want to talk more. You just can see that there's someone inside the system that, that Dr. Coleman is now referring to himself that says, whoa, hold up, hold up. And I'm asking you to look, listen to what I've been saying about how you're going to go about to get them to hold up. And remember, all this stuff about the so, this gene therapy, this cancer therapy is mitigation side. That's the wrong first step. So be careful. Like if you're listening to me, oh, we're going to fight this. Like the mask issue, you no, know, that's the bat. You're, you're already behind the eight ball. Why you have to do stuff like what Alphonse Fagiolo does or what John Jay is saying? Because you didn't preload the problem with your paperwork that shows that you can't be underneath the jurisdiction to have this happen. So you're fighting for, with hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy right in your face instead of having your fortifications way far away so they can't get at you. So anyway, here's a, an a, independent virologist and vaccine expert formerly with the GAVI, Aunt Gavi, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation saying, hold it, hold it, hold, hold up, hold up. Your mitigation measures are going to be a monstrous disaster. And to whom it concerns? The whole entire population of the world. That includes my listeners. Well, those of you that are on the world, those of you that are beaming, we can get this on the beam out in the out in the inner universe and then past the solar system. Uh, maybe you can turn your gaze here, but maybe not. Maybe the w solar wind will blow it your way. And uh, the joke about that statement is: remember, he talked about the pandemic. See, that's a fraud. It's the color of a pandemic that they're using to bring this whole thing forward. So, whether or not he wants to d d design it that way, design the statement, I don't know. To me, that was a fraudulent statement, but he's telling you the truth. So, read between the lines, you see the truth. On the face of it, it sounds like a warning. Maybe he got a little bit of conscience. AI versus crystallography predicting pathogenic variants. This is part of what Sound Minds pulled together, just the gobs and gobs of links of stuff. I tore through it as, as fast and as, as efficient as I could and still get the ideas. I read through a lot of it, trying to put it all together. My mind started reading through the lines and to talk to about it directly, all what he put together on the surface and then read between lines would take forever. I mean, just more than one broadcast of so much. You can get the links. I'll put that, that link in the broadcaster. But AI versus crystallography predicting pathogenic variants. What I found fascinating about this story, the whole these stories are fascinating, what we can do or what we think we can do notwithstanding the fraud that they're trying to attempt and do for the profit. No, not like the biblical profit. No, the, the money, the commerce. Is that the, you'll see in this story, and I'll just touch it as a, as, a, as a summary, where they admit they're using AI and that the first programs have only been 55% accurate. Best. The best programs, AI programs, are 55% accurate relative to this specific subject matter as well. So, right there, we have, to me, that's just, even if AI was considered something, and it's not just pattern recognition, but they want to make it mind, thought, brain, it's a half-wit, at best. It's a half-wit. And they're using that to do your medicine at this point. They're mo that's their models, essentially. Well, you look a little farther, and then they talk about there's a second-generation iteration of AI. They claim it to be something like 94% accurate, which they claim can equate to actual experimentation. Now, I don't know about you, but anything I've ever experimented never turned out the way I wanted. You still had to go after that experiment, figure out what. You still having to figure it out. Nothing seems to go as planned when you're planning among mice. AI prediction. The AI came out on the second generation 
and found out that the scientists who were smart compared to a halfwit were not accurate in their actual estimation based on certain pre premises that were built into it. And on review, the experts found out they were just above a halfwit and didn't have it right. That their new AI can do pattern recognition better than they can and actually can do other things beyond their perception. Which showed me that pattern recognition is very powerful too. It doesn't, it doesn't replace your mind and your thought. It doesn't, it, it's not really going to do what they claim. It's a tool. It's like the PCR is a tool, but in the proper way. The AI exposed that the scientists and experts that, that are working on you right now with all this are halfwits. They are wrong on what they do. They can be shown to be wrong. And when they're told they're wrong, they deny it. And then when a few go back and look, they say, oh, we were wrong. The new generation of AI is able to find that pattern recognition-wise, the experts don't know what they're talking about. So this little story was really the most important for me to be able to say, the people that are supposedly the experts are only drips under pressure because they aren't knowledgeable. We really don't know what's going on. It's just like this same nonsense of what best science is. It's, it's BS. It's BS, best science. It's not actual science. It's not the, the learning, the working toward gaining knowledge. And then, as I say, you have to properly apply it. But they're showing us that the AI up until just recently was a halfwit. The scientists who were just a little smaller, smarter than halfwit sat in all the things they knew until a better AI came along to objectively show that they didn't know what they're talking about. That doesn't mean that that AI knows what it's looking at, but it could show it was enough to show that the experts are not better, much better than the halfwit. And this is what all your medicine's running on right now, which the power to, in my mind, that this story shows me. And on this, on all of this, we had the story last year that I broached that I didn't have a link for. We just saw it go through. It was a picture. A 65-year-old woman, te Texas woman, tackled, arrested for refusing to wear a mask in a day at a, after the uh, governor lifted the mandate. This is the story that a half-wit has now imposed on society that the has to be less than half-wit. That society has to be less knowledgeable than the 55% half-wit AI to not see the pattern of fraud that they would beat, allow this woman to be beat up. That if we go back to that AI and list of information that Sound Minds has made, I have a link that I'll put in the, or was it, the, um, the, the blogcaster it'll be put in to the true tube that he's had another account because they're having trouble at YouTube. He made it, he, he's trying to salvage that YouTube account to show you stuff while I'm talking. But he has now sent, made a list of links that you can go to find the information that he found that starts with the CDC's attempt to patent that. Patent, it's about commerce, not about knowledge. Halfwits are running the show. They call themselves experts, and everybody buys into it. It's the public buy-in. Uh, you can get the links of the other deep dive that was just done. And I'll send you the link here. I don't have the time to talk about it. But you'll see a lin another lineage of proof that shows this thing is not about reality at all. It's a fabrication. It's a promotion to advance commerce. These people don't have to be scientists, I guess is the point. And that's why halfwits can run the show. Less than halfwits will agree. Okay? And so then a woman that goes out and says, I'm going to not wear a mask, I have rights, she gets beat down. Well, apparently, it happens again to the lady, uh, and SoundMind sends me an, another link, another place they arrest her again. Video, body cam shows, body cam shows footage of a maskless woman, second arrest, this time at a Texas City store. Uh, don't, I won't, again, the story is here, I've been telling you that you're going to have to treat this different. The woman says I want, uh, she wants to school people on her rights. My response to that is I hope that she understands how to protect her rights from less than half wits. As you can get evidenced but through the process of John Jay in this very condition, making your reports. And I've asked 
sound minds, if there's some way to get in touch with this lady who wants to school people on her rights, I hope she's not schooled on the fact she has none unless she can protect them, on perfecting John Jay's address of this problem, where they have cited her for crimes trespass and uh, resisting arrest or something. In fact, the trespass is on her where the stores were open to the public. All right? The assault is on her. The abduction is on her for the affront to her ability to accept their invitation. And until people start understanding, as I said before, where are your property rights? Where has someone relinquished it? What's the extent of someone's authority? You don't respond correctly. I told you this day was coming and we're here. This will start happening to you, and I hope this doesn't get so much overbearing for her. But she she can still salvage a lot of this. She's going to have to, have to take the bull by the horns the correct way, not just thinking that she can school anybody who doesn't want to listen. I mean, I, there was times I wanted to listen as a in school, and I just couldn't get it. There's those, those topics that just don't make the connection for you. Maybe you didn't have the neurons quite yet. I don't know what it was. Just some, for as good as I thought, as I did did in school, and as, as overachiever as I as I I enjoyed all the stuff that was available to go learn, I just couldn't get enough. There was just sometimes something I was being told by someone who wanted to tell me I couldn't get it. And so be careful when you think you're going to talk to someone. You're not going to talk to anybody that don't want to hear it, and the cops don't want to hear it. But if you approach it wrong, you, she tried to give her federal rights to to a cop, but they don't care. She's got a different problem then. John Jay's way out is going to help her. You have to know these things. Governor DeSantis says no vaccine passports for Floridians. Well, it says here the fantastic news of lucky citizens of Florida. The breaking open line. Lucky citizens of Florida. This is a crime against Floridians. I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate we're not going to have to have... Uh, Floridians aren't going to have a, a health passport or something that you're asymptomatic to, that they can't find the infectious agent, or that you're not communicable a disease, that you have to have a passport. But lucky citizens is the wrong attitude here completely. I told you these guys, even the even these Republicans that are g releasing the state, opening the state, they're still holding on to power that they have no right to. That people who are less than halfwits are using in order to brutalize other people. I'm really glad I'm just, uh, maybe I won't say it. I'm not going to say it. What I was going to think, I'm not going to say it. I'm just glad there's still people <laughs> that it's just going down and people are just being arrested at this point, even though they shouldn't be. John Jay has a better angle for everybody if you go find that broadcast or go look him up. It's not what, not everything, just what the process of the investigative reporter, as I keep telling you. You take your incident report. It was Peggy Hall. That was her name. Talking to him. She takes an incident report. Exactly what I've been telling you. But do it specific on how John Jay says your rights have been violated, not because you have federal rights. Those are there. They can help. But you have told you, the way they've done it in Texas, it looks like the local government or the local businesses can actually have a decision. You're placed in that regard as the same thing as they did in Oregon, where you have to now negotiate. At the point of negotiation, you don't have the outright right. Yes, uh, free and slave. Thank you. John J. Singleton. I did, the, I did the comment on that, and we went through that a little bit. Track down his process for this specific thing. Don't use it for anything else unless you can prove that it does work. Again, don't extend what like Alphonse Fagiolo says to something that's already in the record complete. I would not even try his angle until until I undid what they did and got the got the the record better. And then you're still subject to the decision of someone else because you've allowed it. Anyway, so this is a please look very carefully at where you're at, learn the battlefield. Don't disregard wise counsel if I can be so bold to say that I can provide at least the counsel of a proper pathway, as I have been, I believe, no errors yet to find over the last few decades. Thank you, Grimm, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Real I'm going to get that out one time. What you do over there, keep us going, keep the archives up for everyone to see, the broadcaster and all the syndicators. Thank you very much, and all the commenters, I appreciate it. I'll be with you, tech diffs or nature willing.
Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose. A can of whoop ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass.